Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining the Critical Race Studies program at UCLA Law for a program today entitled Racing the Bar, the Racial Construction of Merit and the California Bar Exam. This is an incredibly important topic. It's at the heart of both um, equality of opportunity to enter professions, but also access to justice, because we know that uh, attorneys who are from traditionally um, traditionally underserved communities and underrepresented communities are more likely to serve those communities. And so this topic is so, so important. And I know that we have um, students joining us, we have alumni joining us, um, faculty from other schools and members of the community. And we're just very delighted to have this uh, great uh, lineup of speakers today. Um, so we are going to hear from Professor Victor Quintanilla, who is um, at the uh, Indiana Maurer School of Law. Uh, where he is tenured, where he is an expert in civil procedure, um, empirical critical race theory, psychology and the law, and diversity in legal education and the legal profession. And one of my enduring disappointments is that uh, seven years ago when he was on the job market, uh, he accepted the Indiana offer uh, before we could uh, uh, make him an offer here at UCLA. So one of these days we will, we will get that uh, corrected. Um, and after we hear from Professor Quintanilla about um, his team's research on the California bar exam, we're gonna hear from two of the uh, leading lights in uh, critical race theory at the national level. Um, first from Professor Cheryl Harris, the um, Rosalind and Arthur, and I've just blanked on the, uh, the Rosalind and, and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Law, um, and the author of many, many works, but one which is, is uh, especially influential in critical race theory, but also in many other fields, is Whiteness as Property, uh, published in 1994 in the Harvard Law Review. Um, and then we're going to hear from Professor Devin Carbato. Um, uh, here of UCLA and both both Professor Harris and Professor Carbato and myself are among the co-founders of the Critical Race Studies Program here at UCLA, which is celebrating its 20th birthday this year. Um, and Professor Carbato is the Honorable Harry Pragerson uh, Chair in Law, and he is known for uh, a wide ranging body of work. And I will just mention one of his most influential publications, um, his book, Acting White, um, uh, <laughs> Acting White, Rethinking Race in a Post-Racial America, published with uh, Me Too Gulati. Each of them is gonna take about 10 minutes to respond to Professor Quintanilla. And then we're gonna have a 30 minute question and answer session. And the way that you will be asking questions is to use down in the center of your screen, the Q and A box to submit a written question. And then we will be fielding those to the panelists. Um, and, um, you know, I, I guess I will just hand it over to um, to Professor Quintanilla, to Victor, to share with us his work, and um, we will get going because I know that we have a lot that we want to um, uh, share and and talk about. Thank you. Thank you so greatly, Laura. Let's see. I'm going to share the screen. And then, here we are. Can you see this okay? Wonderful. Um, Laura, thank you so greatly for this opportunity to present today. Uh, Professor Cheryl Harris, thank you for being a part of this discussion. 
and Professor Devin Carbato, thank you uh, kindly as well for your remarks and for being here. I'm grateful to discuss this project that I've recently completed with a team of other researchers and scholars entitled Examining California's Cut Score, an Empirical Analysis of Minimum Competency, Public Protection, Disparate Impact, and National Standards. It's, it was an amazing project to work on, and I'm hopeful that this research will be helpful and useful uh, to policymakers who are weighing now how to improve representation within California's legal profession. Um, and I must say that I know that many of the themes that we'll be discussing have been um, discussed and theorized by um, researchers before me. And I'm grateful to be able to offer this, um, I think, important empirical evidence um, for many of the kinds of uh, themes and theories that they've been putting forward for many years. Uh, over the past several years, I've had uh, uh, the wonderful fortune of working with a, a team of researchers on a wider project called Mindsets in Legal Education. And we're from many different disciplines, including law, psychology, sociology, education, and across many different institutions, IU, USC, UCLA, University of Michigan, and Stanford. And several of us work together uh, to put together this, uh, this project. Having said this, let's begin with a pressing challenge, the lack of diversity in California's legal profession. Between 5,000 and 6,000 attorneys are admitted to the state bar every year, and the number of attorneys on, on record has nearly doubled since 1980, reaching 190,000 as of December 2019. Yet, while uh, white attorneys account for nearly 68% of California's active licensed attorneys, um, people of color uh, account for 60% of California's population. And what we know is Latino and Black attorneys are particularly underrepresented among California's attorneys in comparison to the statewide population. Uh, for example, while 36% of California's population is Hispanic or Latinx, Latinx lawyers constitute only 7% of the legal profession. Similarly, um, while 6% of California's population is Black, Black lawyers constitute only uh, a 4% of the legal profession. And this is a pressing problem for many reasons. The state bar recognizes that having a diverse legal profession positively impacts the administration of justice, ensures fairness and promotes the rule of law. And the mandate to promote a diverse and inclusive legal profession is central to the state bar's mission of public pretension. These values, equality of opportunity, diversity and inclusion are core values. And increasing the number of persons of underrepresented groups in the legal profession and the judiciary is essential to enhance um, the administration, both the substantive reality and perceived fairness and legitimacy of the legal system. So it's also essential to secure legal services and access to justice for all in society and to provide exemplars and role models um, as well. Moreover, we live in a multicultural nation, an interconnected world, and this broadening of inclusiveness is economically necessary, morally imperative, and constitutionally legitimate. The lack of diversity within the profession is not inherent, it's not fixed, and it's not natural. Rather, it's socially produced and constructed by the policy choices and in institutions affecting the pipeline into the legal profession. Gatekeeping decisions by institutions produce, reinforce, and reproduce this underrepresentation. The pipeline into the legal profession involves key gatekeeping points. Um, the LSAT, the law school, and matriculation to the law school, and licensure as bar exam. Today, I'm going to be focusing on one aspect uh, of this, the bar exam, and the, particularly the selection the pass of the pass threshold on the bar exam, the cut score. Um, what I'll do is I'll discuss how the choice within this gatekeeping institution produces disparities and reinforces inequality, and specifically how this lack of diversity in the legal profession can be enlarged or attenuated by changing decisions about the cut score. The underrepresentation of the legal profession that we see today is socially produced by a set of institutional and historical decisions at multiple stages of this pipeline, including policy decisions about the cut score of the bar exam. In short, uh, the research that I'll present shows that the choice of cut score is also a choice about the legal profession's racial and ethnic makeup. Um, indeed, there are many available cut scores to choose from. 1350 is the most common. It's the medium, the mode, the cut score used across most jurisdictions in the United States. 1330 
is New York's current cut score, another large ethnically diverse, economically vibrant state. And 1300 is the lowest cut score in the United States used by several additional states. California's cut score of 1440 was the second highest in the country until this August when it was adjusted to 1390. The prior score of 1440 was established by the state bar in 1987 and apparently um, without any standard setting or validity study being conducted about that particular choice made. Um, while our research was underway in this project, the California court lowered California's cut score to 1390. And in so doing, the court say that its decision was based on findings from recently completed bar exam studies, as well as data from ongoing studies, and that it would consider any further changes pending recommendations offered by the forthcoming Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of the California bar exam. The research that I'll present today will reveal that mo moving from the second highest to the fourth highest cut score will continue the historical pattern of significant disparities in passing rates between whites and minorities on the California bar exam. At 1390, we'll see that the cut score would have only a modest impact over the period studied and will continue to produce significantly disparities on the basis of race and ethnicity compared to the national meeting of 1350 or New York standard of 1330 or the simulated model of 1330. Um, just as an overview, I'm gonna lead us through four parts of this uh, study. So first, we're going to discuss racial disparities in bar passage in 1440. Then second, a study um, that was a simulation examining what the effect of a different cut score would have been on racial disparities in bar passage uh, over the last 10 years. The second is what uh, this change in cut score would have done to diversity within California's legal profession had a different cut score been adopted 10 years ago. And then the third will evaluate the relationship between cut scores and attorney discipline. All right, so let's turn first to racial disparities in bar passage at 1440. Um, we know that from 2009 to 2018 to the current day, the number of examinees who sat for the California bar exam has ranged between around 12,000 um, and the proportion of applicants passing the exam has steadily decreased over time. And the percentage failing has increased on an exam by exam basis across time for all groups. This figure shows that at 1440 over the past 11 years, um, there has been consistent uh, disparities in passing rates among examinees of different racial uh, groups and ethnic backgrounds. This data revealed um, a consistent pattern in bar passage percentages over 21 administrations where minorities consistently pass at a significantly lower percentage rate than whites. Now, one of the most engaging aspects of this study is rather than examining on the 143,000 bar exams taken in the form stylized above, uh, above for example, um, we focused um, instead in restructuring the data to focus on the 85,000 unique examinees within this 11-year um, period. The data set included each applicant's exam history, including the applicant's performance data for all subsequent attempts to pass the California bar exam across the 11-year period, which allowed us to focus the unit analysis on examinees, not exams, this meant that when conducting analyses using the data set, we counted each examinee only once, even if the examinee had taken multiple times. Um, many agree actually that this would be the, the best way, the preferred way to analyze these questions, though few have been able to analyze the data this way. Thankfully, we were able to work with the State Bar of California, gather data and reconfigure the data in this way to examine across applicants. This allows us to categorize and determine whether each applicant was a bar passer, uh, which means that they would have either passed on their first time or eventually passed on one of their repeated attempts or a never passer within the 11 time, year time period. Uh, so by way of example, let's say we have an applicant who took the California bar three times. If the applicant passed at 1440 on their third attempt, they would be considered an eventual passer and hence a passer. Um, as another example, if we have an applicant who took the exam three times, and did not pass at 1440 um, at no point in this 11 year window, then they would be considered a never passer. I'll also uh, describe, um, as I'll describe, the data set also includes whether they would have passed at different thresholds, which is going to be essential for allowing us to engage in simulations using actual score data. And I'll mention this shortly. Um, so let's begin with the question of what the racial and ethnic composition is within this pool of 85,000 applicants over these 11 years. 57% of them were white, about 48,000 test takers. 
5% were black, about 4,000 uh, test takers. 21% were Asian, about 18,000 uh, test takers. 10% roughly, 10.7 um, were Latinx, um, about 9,000 uh, examinees. And then um, 1.6 were other, um, slightly over 1,000. And examining the, the data in this way, the next question is, what is the percentage of applicants who pass the bar exam, whether on their first time or eventually um, at the 1440 cut score? What we find is that 75.8 of these applicants um, were bar passers, 24.2 were never passers, um, even after multiple attempts. What is the uh, eventual passage at 1440 within racial and ethnic groups and how do these differ? So we actually see a wide um, disparity in passage, for example, relative to white applicants, relative to black applicants. And we also see substantial gaps for other minorities. For example, 80.5% of white examinees eventually pass the bar exam, yet only 53.1% um, of black applicants eventually pass the bar exam during this period. And Hispanic, Latinx, and Asian examinees eventually pass the bar exam at 69.5 or 71.5 respectively. But more to the point, what this means is that for every 1,000 white applicants, 805 um, pass the bar exam. For every 1,000 black app examinees, 531 pass at the 1440 um, pass rate, revealing a substantial and wide disparity. Now, um, the way that we've restructured this data also allowed us to examine how a change in the cut score would have impacted these disparities on eventual bar passage across these 11 years. So this centered on the highest score of the applicant. So for, by, by way of example, let's say an applicant took the bar exam three times. The first time they reached 1330, the second time 1350, and the third time they reached 1390 our analysis would take their highest score and it would say at 1440, they wouldn't, they'd be a never, they would have never passed. Um, but if the cut score had been 1390 or 1350, if it had been 1390 as adopted um, this August, they would have passed the California bar exam within this 11 year window. And what this does is it allows a very precise analysis of how changes in the cut score would have exacerbated or mitigated these racial and ethnic disparities and numbers of attorneys would have been admitted to the legal profession. So let's turn to this. Um, if the cut score is 1440, as we've said, 53% of black applicants would have been bar passers and 46.9% would have been never passers. For white applicants, 80.5% would have been bar passers and 19.5 would have been never passers. However, when we change the cut score, let's say at to 1350, this changes. So 70% of black, black applicants would be bar passers and 29.9 would be never passers. For white applicants, 89.5% would be um, bar passers and 10.5 would be never passers. And we can also look at the racial achievement gap um, between black and white applicants and see how this closes depending on different cut scores. So what we see is that there's a, a, a black white uh, achievement gap of 27.4% if we maintained the current cut score at 1440. This gap somewhat narrows uh, slightly um, by adopting a 1390 cut, uh, cut score. It begins to uh, uh, close more greatly when we select a 1350. And again, as we move to different cut scores, the uh, these disparities and achievement gaps begin to attenuate and narrow. Another way of looking at this um, is to examine um, this from another angle. So this data shows that the event, based on these eventual pass rates of minority applicants, it increases at much higher rates compared to whites, particularly for Latin and black, uh, black applicants, depending on where we put the cut score. There's a steeper line, steeper increases uh, as compared to whites as the cut, cut score changed from 1400 to 1300 in this simulation, which means that selecting a lower cut score would have had a greater impact on the proportion of minorities eventually passing the California bar exam and joining the legal profession. The largest increase, by the way, in these bands um, is um, when selecting the 1350 cut score, as evidenced by the steep line and increases um, that we see going from 1390 to 1350. Um, and then the, you'll notice that these gaps begin to narrow um, when we begin 
moving more closely to 1300, which represents great, the greatest narrowing of these disparities and achievement gaps between whites and underrepresented minority applicants. Um, as diversity of the legal profession is an important value that we seek to promote, we must recognize that the choice of cut score is impinging upon our collective ability to achieve these goals. Now, the second study analyzed how the selection of a cut score would have altered the inflow of new, newly admitted attorneys and ultimately the composition of the legal profession in California. So let's examine this. Uh, to begin, this analysis shows that the cut score has a powerful in-group impact on the number of newly admitted racial and ethnic minorities in the legal profession. While all racial and ethnic groups would have passed the California bar exam at higher percentage rates, let's focus on the black uh, applicants. If 1390 had been adopted at the cut score in uh, 2009, the number of newly, the percentage of newly um, licensed black attorneys would have increased by 12.5%. That's 294 uh, newly admitted black attorneys um, that would have been present, but aren't. Um, similarly, if the cut score had been selected at 1350 um, uh, in 2009, then what we would have seen is a 32.1% increase in newly admitted black attorneys and 753 more black attorneys um, in the legal profession. Finally, if 1300 had been selected, we would see here a 49.2% increase in newly admitted black attorneys. And this is uh, over 1000 more black attorneys that would be present within the California legal profession. Um, next, now we take these inflows and we examine how this affects the composition of those groups within the legal profession. We add them to the existing pool of attorneys. And here we know that there's 190,000 roughly active lawyers in California. Um, and you can take a look at how many there are. There's 129,000 white lawyers, 7,600 black lawyers, 13,000 Hispanic Latin lawyers, 24,000 Asian lawyers. And so what this simulation does is it, it, it reveals that had 1390 been adopted as a cut score in 2009, there would have been the additional 294 black lawyers. And this would have been a 3.9% increase um, within black attorneys in the legal profession in California. If we had adopted 1350, we would see a 10% increase in the percentage of black lawyers in California. Uh, by adding these additional 753 lawyers. And if we had adopted a 1300, again, there's an additional 1,000 lawyers, and it means there's an additional 15.4% um, uh, Black legal professionals, Black lawyers in California. Now, um, the third part of the study is essentially um, examining one of the common responses that we see, um, which is this concern about uh, what changing a cut score does to public protection. The idea is that lowering the cut score would lead to more um, unethical or potentially um, um, less professional attorneys. So to do this kind of analysis, we examined the American Bar Association Survey of Discipline Systems, their sold surveys, which reports complaints filed by members of the public, charges filed by disciplinary authorities, and the number of disciplinary actions taken against lawyers. We have six years of this data across 48 US jurisdictions from 2013 to 2018. And we explicitly tested for um, whether there was uh, cut score predicts, whether it correlates with discipline. We then examine whether the selection of these higher cut scores reduces the number of complaints filed, attorneys charged or uh, attorneys subject to discipline. Um, that is we evaluated whether the, there's a negative relationship that existed. Higher cut score means lower discipline, lower cut score means higher discipline. We examined uh, the, this um, theory and we standardized discipline rates to per 1000 attorney basis so we could compare across states. What we found, again, the theory is that a higher cut score screens out um, more unethical or less professional attorneys, but we actually didn't, uh, didn't find that. In, indeed, there is, um, there's no significant relationship between the choice of a cut score and public complaints. Analyzing across these six years, 48 jurisdictions, there was no relationship. Um, in fact, uh, though not, uh, depending on how you analyze this, it's not a hard, high R squared, um, it actually cut the other way. The higher the cut score, there are slightly more complaints filed against attorneys, though that was fairly significant. 
Um, but it, it just shows that there really is no negative relationship here. When we take a look at um, disciplinary actions, um, when we take a look at uh, charges, we see similarly, there is no significant relationship between the choice of cut score and charges. And finally, when we take a look at um, disciplinary actions taken against lawyers, there just is no relationship between the selection of a cut score and attorney discipline across these six years of data, um, of using all of these sold surveys and 48 jurisdictions. Um, it suggests there's no causal or predictive relationship on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis between high cut scores and public protection as measured by these disciplinary statistics. So in conclusion, um, what we began with was this pronounced and pressing problem of lack of diversity and underrepresentation within the profession. But this is not um, an inherent fixed or natural phenomenon. In fact, it's socially produced and constructed by our policy choices and the pipeline within the legal profession and gatekeeping decisions and in, by institutional players at this pipeline, produce or reinforce or reproduce this underrepresentation. We focused on the bar um, exam and particularly the choice of a cut score. And we made the point that there are many different uh, available cut scores that one could choose from. Um, and we also saw that depending on where this cut score is selected, it can truly and pronouncedly affect the uh, diversity and representation in the legal profession. Choices within these gatekeeping institutions produce disparities and reinforce inequality and specifically this lack of diversity in the legal profession can be enlarged or attenuated by changing decisions about the cut score. The choice of a cut score is also a choice about the legal profession's racial and ethnic makeup and the diversity in the legal profession. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That was, that was really terrific. Um, really terrific. Thank you. It was a lot to take in. So I'm just going to very briefly summarize um, three takeaways from, from this study. Um, the first takeaway um, is that changing the cut store would ameliorate this racial gap in the pass rate. And just as one example of that, if we move that cut, store, cut score down to 1350, which is the national median, um, then 70% of Blacks would pass the bar um, at some point. And that would be, uh, that would be, that would reduce that gap, right? That racial gap. Um, the second takeaway, um, the cut score choice, and it is a choice, uh, affects the diversity of the bar, right? So that, for example, if we're talking about the 1350 median uh, cut score nationally, um, if that had been in place in 2009, then there would have been a 32% increase in uh, Black attorneys in the state, 753 more. Um, very significant. Um, and then, and, and just to be clear, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, the cut score refers to the, the, the numerical score that the bar examiners set to decide who's going to pass, right? Above that score, you pass, below it, um, you fail. And this score has been in place for, for uh, since 1987, the 1440, um, which was just lowered temporarily to 1390. Um, and I think I heard you say, Victor, that there was no validity study done when it was increased up to 1440, you know, so and that's just really shocking. And then the final and third takeaway, um, there is no predictive relationship between this higher cut score, the 1440, and say, keeping out bad lawyers, right? And in order to test that, what you looked at is you looked at aggregate data from 48 states in the US, um, and you saw that there was not this kind of uh, connection between the cut score and either complaints by clients or disciplinary actions. Um, terrific. So now we will turn to the second portion of our program, which is going to be um, 
contributions uh, from uh, Cheryl and Devin to just kind of give us their, um, their thoughts and maybe raise issues that, that they see that they wanna learn more about, about it or that they wanna see um, explored in additional research or that they want us to, to act on today. Cheryl. Well, thank you very much. And um, Victor, it's really a, a great um, study. Uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues. Extremely rich, very timely, and couldn't be more important. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. They're not necessarily all in order of their importance, but one of the things that stuck out to me uh, is that uh, because of negative stereotypes regarding Black intellectual ident uh, ability, as well as to some extent Latinx uh, intellectual ability, to some extent the disparate impact of the exam on Black and Latino applicants for some people might seem to be a natural consequence of those presumed deficiencies. In other words, we have a lot of societal messaging regarding deficiencies of groups' abilities. Um, but what I found really striking is that the data reveals that the cut scores appear to be having some impact on all um, people of color, including Asians. So while it's not as deep a disparity as it is for Blacks or Latinx, um, there is some significant difference. And I noticed that the eventual passers, uh, the difference uh, be between uh, Asians and whites is a difference of about nine points, which is you know nothing to sneeze at. Um, what I find interesting is that uh, against this backdrop of negative uh, assumptions about intellectual stereo uh, or, or intellectual ability of Blacks and Latinx, you often have the positioning of Asian Americans as a model minority who are free from the um, impact of societal discrimination. But we have here evidence that I would argue maybe cuts the other way. So I, I found that to be quite interesting. I think also with regard to the larger implications of the study, I would argue that it's really a classic illustration of the embedded nature of racial preferences in presumably race neutral criteria. Um, so mainstream legal and public discourse has often described affirmative action, particularly race or gender conscious affirmative action as a racial, as a preference in which people are being given an advantage on the basis of that identity category. And Devin and I, wrote a paper about this some time ago called the new racial preferences. But I think this is a really an example of a kind of old racial preference, if you will, um, because here we see how the routine operation of a selection system works to install a preference for whites. Um, and I wanna be clear that that doesn't mean that all whites will pass. As your study points out, there is a group of white never passers. And we might speculate as to who those folks are and why that is. It could be that it's class difference. It could be that they're classified as white, but that are, they are immigrants for whom English is not a first language. There's a whole range of speculations we might make, but the point is that the distribution of probabilities here that you're mapping has favored whites over all other groups. And I would argue that that could be conceived as a preference. And one might inquire whether that's legally permitted under current California law, which as you know, Proposition 209 prohibits the state from quote, discriminating against or granting preferential treatment to any individual on the basis of race, sex, ethnicity in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. Now we have public, uh, Proposition 16 is on the ballot uh, this cycle to repeal Proposition 209, but as we sit here, Prop 209 is still state law. And I would argue that the answer to that question is not obvious. Obviously, one would need to determine whether or not the bar falls within state operations as the statute defines it, or as the constitution defines it. That is, is the Cal bar a public employer or uh, institution of public education or contracting? One could certainly argue that it isn't, but it would be really ironic if the defense of the use of a high cut score by the Cal bar rested on the basis that the state bar examiners were exempt from the, positions of, uh, from the provisions of the California constitution that bind the state itself, right? So uh, as a public policy matter, I guess I would say that that argument, as uh, some of the young folk might say, is not a good look. I mean, you know, for the Cal Bar to say, well, we're, we're not covered by Prop 209 because we're not um, a, a state entity engaged in these activities as defined in Section 31. 
the larger question on this question of a preference, um, we have some California state law that has defined it pretty broadly, uh, has said that a preference uh, means something more than just ordinary discrimination. And as Devin and I argued in our paper, if we go by both the kind of dictionary definition, which has been in fact what the courts have relied on here, it means giving an advantage of, uh, uh, of to one group over another. Um, and so in that regard, while the courts have really looked at efforts that were directed towards the alleviation of discrimination or inequality for uh, people of color, there's nothing in the text of the existing law that restricts the application of uh, the anti-preference provision in the California Constitution to rules that specifically mention race. And I would argue that at least conceptually, what you've identified here is a racial preference uh, that favors whites that might in fact not be entirely square with existing California law. Um, the, the other point is that um, it goes to the last part of your study, which I really, really find fascinating, which is the lack of any meaningful relationship between the cut score and its asserted justification, which is protecting the public from lawyers' incompetence. And your use of the metric of disciplinary statistics, finding that there is no statistically significant relationship um, is really remarkable because as you say, in some places it actually looks like it's cutting the other way, uh, even though it may not be statistically significant, it's still rather interesting that you can't even find it, um, you find it actually pushing in the opposite direction slightly. Um, this is really given the other statement that is noted on page 24 of the study, um, I think it's citing from the state bar letter to the state Supreme Court, this is note 52, um, here, this letter acknowledges that there is no clear measure or definition of public protection in the context of a licensing exam. So the proxy that we're using, which is the disciplinary data, um, this letter says, quote, is problematic on many fronts, most especially because an exam governing entry into practice is not intended to be predictive of future misconduct. So if we were to translate that back into sort of existing Title VII law, what we're saying is uh, this, the, the justification for the use of this um, measure that is producing the significant disciplinary or, or uh, exclusionary impact would have to be justified under Title VII as a business necessity. Or if we said the Cal Bar is not an employer covered by Title VII, it would still have to be justified under equal protection under Washington versus Davis, which is a much looser standard than Title VII. But even if we go with the looser standard, even if we go with Washington versus Davis, it says there has to be a rational relationship between the criteria and the uh, objective, um, the, the justification. The fact though, uh, th that means some kind of reasonable relationship between the test and protecting the public. The fact that uh, there is no statistical significant relationship between them really raises a, a pretty deep question as to what are we, what is the justification? Um, and so it brings me back full circle to this point. So often when we have a challenge to criteria like these that produce racially disparate impact, often when people read it through the lens of, well, this is just an effort to lower the bars so that you can get over it and get otherwise unqualified people in um, and secure some kind of racial benefit. Um, and so it's viewed as a kind of uh, attempt to bend the criteria to favor one's own group. But what disparate impact analysis actually does and what your study actually illustrates is that often what happens when you closely examine criteria that produce this kind of impact, you find often that the relationship between the criteria and the asserted reason for the criteria is not really all that strong. And the question then becomes relevant not only to racial minorities or women who were excluded by virtue of the criteria, it's relevant to everybody because in the absence of a rational relationship between the reason the objective and the test, it's unnecessarily excluding a lot of people who are otherwise competent and burdening everybody. So maybe there are other reasons to utilize the test. 
Um, but maybe there's also other ways to secure the objective and I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Cheryl. So it's uh, um, always difficult to follow Cheryl because she says uh, the very things that I, that I want to say, uh, but, but, it, but, it, but it's helpful um, in this respect because I want to start uh, precisely where you um, uh, ended, Cheryl, and uh, begin first by saying this is a terrific, 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 did I say terrific uh, project, Victor, that comes at a really important uh, moment. Laura put it really well when she says it resides at the intersection of access to justice and access to the profession. If there is ever a moment in which we're thinking about what lawyers mean vis-a-vis -vis democracy, this is certainly it. Is ever, if there's ever a moment in which we're thinking about who lawyers are and how that might bear on expressions of democracy, this is it as well. So uh, my comments, I think, um, are going to focus largely on, again, uh, where Cheryl went, which is to say there's a way in which your um, uh, project in this iteration puts to one side um, an important question that I get why you put it to one side and that I'm asking that you pick up again, particularly as you move in the direction of the scholarship, which is to say the question of why they might be a disparate impact is not something the paper takes up. And I think we have to take that up in some sense for the reason that Cheryl describes. The assumption is both that um, people who are quote unquote underperforming are quote unquote underperforming because they don't work hard enough, they're not as smart, et cetera. So there's a particular kind of argument about race and merit that goes uncontested if we don't ask the question about why the dispatch disparate impact. And it also um, limits our capacity to contest the merit frame itself, again, along the lines that Cheryl just suggested, which is it's not getting you what you want anyway. So thinking about the why, I think, opens up space um, to challenge uh, default social meanings about race along the lines of all of these disparities. So what I want to do in the limited time that I have is just um, situate your project then in the context of broader debates about disparities and how we should think about them. Um, and your project, I think, is very much a simpatical um, with that. Uh, my starting point is to suggest that both for pragmatic reasons and substantive reasons, it's probably helpful to link the intervention you're performing to the historical racial role that bars have played. The color bar for your bar is no exception to that, to the extent that they function as kind of exclusive racialized gendered clubs. It's important to mark that. It's important to mark that not just because um, it leads to an engagement that is more historicized, but also because it forces the bar examiners to ask something like the following question. Do you want the current regime to continue to reproduce that history? Yes or no? Yes or no? If I'm telling you that the history of this institution, the history of the bar exam is one that is replete with explicit racial bars that were designed to keep people out. And you have a metric that is not explicitly racialized to be sure, but that is keeping people out. Do you not see that there is some continuity between those two things? Do you wanna distance yourself from that history or not? I think that question should be front and center for the bar examiners. That's, that's one point that I would put on the table. The second point in relationship to this is that um, telling that story is relevant for doctrinal reasons, a point to which I will come back to um, if I have time. So the point about racial disparities I wanna make are these. So one, we should think of racial disparities as um, signs of racial inequality. So that should be our presumptive starting place. It's a rebuttable presumption, you can rebut it, but we should begin with the understanding that where there's racial disparities, that's a signal that likely there is racial inequality and therefore that racial equality needs to be justified. And we should take that view against the backdrop of again, uh, the way race has functioned in this country. So you can tell that particularized story with respect to the bar, but it's one that we should be talking about uh, more generally. Clearly um, racial disparities exist across multiple domains of social life, we know that. And clearly racial disparities exist, particularly in the context of various testocracies. So we could be talking about the LSAT or the GMAT, 
or um, the MCAT uh, or the SAT. I mean, there are a bunch of different sites where the intervention that you're performing, I think is quite relevant and it's just helpful for us um, to remind ourselves of that. So viewing racial um, disparities as potentially signs of racial inequality allows one to make, I think, three important interventions, um, two of which Cheryl already pointed to. One is it allows us to um, contest the racial preference frame. So if it's the case that racial disparities are signs of racial inequality, then we must do something about them and doing something about them is not a racial preference. And I'll, I'll um, provide another heuristic that might be useful to illustrate that. Second, um, problems of racial inequality, if we view racial disparities as signs of racial inequality are not about intentional bad actors. So it's not as though we're calling the bar examiners intentional bad actors, nasty little racist. That's not the point. You don't need to um, name the problem in that way to mark a racial inequality. Your study bears that out, it seems to me. And um, the final thing I will say on the uh, point about um, viewing racial disparities as signs of racial inequality is that it, um, in a way, uh, opens up space for a particular doctrinal intervention, which again, I'll, I'll come back to, because I think it's helpful to think about your project in relationship to the Washington versus Davis problem and how it fares against that particular um, backdrop. Um, the fifth thing I wanna say is that, um, and this is a point that your project drives home, we talk ad nauseum about problems of diversity and the diversity pipeline. But the diversity pipeline isn't just out there, it's a function of governance choices uh, we make. So I wanna pause uh, for a minute uh, so I can uh, show two visuals that are both on the point about diversity being endogenous and not just and, um, exogenous, but also on uh, why we should be thinking more capaciously about uh, preferences along some of the lines that um, Cheryl already uh, suggests. So let me just show a few slides on this particular uh, point. So here's um, uh, what I wanna uh, say about all of this. The first thing is to note that as early as 1875 in the civil rights cases, um, I will talk, you can read. Um, the court instantiated the idea in 1865 that intervening to address racial inequality was a racial preference. I mean, it's really remarkable that this quote is circulating in 1875. We've stopped slavery, therefore you're good black people is the basic message it communicates. So if we think beyond um, that idea, um, how might we otherwise contest the racial frame? So with the African-American Policy Forum, uh, we sometimes use this particular image. It's a picture of cows. I know I go too far. We're talking about the bar and I'm talking about cows, but it's a useful heuristic. As some of you might know, Kim Crenshaw and Luke Harris started the African-American Policy Forum over two decades ago, and it invites both a contestation of the preference frame and a way of viewing race structurally. So the exercise is the cows are sick, why the cows are sick. And if we had time, we'd go back and forth and you might say the cows are sick because they're not exercising, they're not grazing, they're not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. So it's a blame the cow narrative. That's one reason the cows are sick. Another reason the cows are sick, you might say, is that it's not really about uh, the cows per se, it's about the farmer. You know, the farmer somehow doesn't really like the cows and that's a particular kind of problem. And so we might say in that regard that our farmer is a cow cyst, analogous to a racist, you get the idea. Um, so what do you do about this? Well, you could say, you know, if you pull back the frame, we begin to see that the cows exist in a toxic environment. We're thinking bigger, we're thinking about structural problems. The cows are gonna be sick um, whether or not our farmer is a nasty little cow cyst. The cows are gonna be sick, whether or not they're grazing or not. We could say, as a result of this, uh, cows put on your mask. This is my moment in which we're talking about moss. So I don't need to politicize the conversation about moss, but you know, wear a mask. It's gonna kind of cramp your mooing a little bit. Maybe it's gonna maybe accentuate your ears and you look a little funny, but wear a mask. We could say that. We could say as well, um, go do some cow diversity training, if you like, where you listen to that cow story, that cow story, and you're more sensitive about cows. But we could also say, let's clean up the toxicity in the environment. 
And if we engage in that particular project of cleaning the environment, does it make sense to call this an animal preference for cows? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to say that this particular intervention to deal with an environmental um, inequality problem that the cows are presented with is a preference. Intervening is a preference. So it's that particular sensibility that I think one needs to bear on the problem that Victor describes. Intervening is not a preference, which is why, again, telling a story about the disparate impact is crucial to creating space for this kind of argument so that it doesn't just rest on it's a deficit, but we're going to help them by lowering the score. That's not fundamentally what we want. The final point I'll make is about the pipelines and pools, because this goes to a really important um, uh, argument that you made. Everyone talks about the problem of diversity being this. It's a thin pipeline. We don't have that. And it would be great if we had this robust pipeline. And it seems really abstract, but data is a useful way to think about it as well. Everyone's looking for their associates in the same pool. If everyone's there, you know, there are no black fish, maybe just two black fish. I'm racializing fish. I'm going too far. You get the idea. There's no one over here. Right? And you might say, well, that's a pretty picture. Can we be more specific about it? And I think your project was, more, was very specific about it with respect to the extent to which the cutoff score is itself a pipeline constructed move. But you know, look at these numbers, 1993 to 2013, the representation of uh, clerks who are Latino. Look at those numbers. If you're hiring from there, if, if this, is, this is the same thing as using the 1350 or something like that. In other words, that creates the pool of diversity just as hiring from this gets you 4.5 today from 4.8. So decisions about pipelines, in other words, are pool constructing decisions about which we need to think um, really hard. The final point I'll make about all of this is a doctrinal one. So some of you might remember Washington versus Davis. It's the case that um, instantiates the um, intent standard. And in that case, there was a test. There was a challenge to a test, test 21. Why is that relevant? Because test 21 bore no relationship to on the job police performance, bore no relationship. It bore some relationship to job training and job training bore no relationship to policing. And notwithstanding the absence of test validity in that case, the court says all good, all good. Why? Because disparate impact was not enough to give rise to a colorable eco protection claim. Part of what I'm suggesting is that this study helps to reveal why that standard is problematic. This study helps us to think about ways in which we might intervene in the space doctrinally to tell another kind of story. A story that says the metric that you think is good is not, and the disparity that you think it, it's producing as neutral is actually a moment of racial inequality uh, for the reasons that are bared out in your study and certainly for the reasons uh, that Cheryl uh, described. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to both you, Devin and Cheryl. I wanna to turn to some audience questions in this part of our, um, of our program. And, and Victor, I trust that as, um, as these questions come up, you can actually also engage the discussants comments um, and, uh, and, and brilliance, which you know, sort of tells you why you should have waited and stayed and come to UCLA, but that's another thing. Um, so there are two questions here um, by Pilar and Carol that are, are basically on this question of um, why is it that we're even using this kind of exam to decide whether or not somebody is um, eligible um, to uh, practice law. And so I'm gonna put into the chat um, something that I found in your article, Victor, which was the uh, California uh, Attorney Practice Analysis Working Group Report which is, as I understood it, trying to come up with some kind of alternative um, 
measurement uh, that would look more at kind of practical skills, for example, and uh, routine tasks that lawyers have to do and that kind of thing. But, but Victor, did you wanna say anything more about that? Or um, any of you? I think that, um, I think that both uh, uh, Cheryl and, and Devin have really, I think, illuminated an aspect, which is um, this is the way that we've done bar exams uh, for a long time. And there's a historical context here that reaches back um, uh, you know, decades. And the, um, there's, a, there's a hidden history of why bar exams have come to be. Um, and bar exams uh, were exclusionary. That is part of the original history of, of bar exams. Um, and I think that there is a certain path dependency once bar exams take place and it becomes uh, harder to challenge, especially once people have made their way through um, these challenging uh, situations. There is an aspect of going through particular rit uh, rituals and then rationalizing them afterwards. I think there's exclusionary reasons uh, for the bar exam. I think there's some really open questions about whether we could do this much better and actually key um, the way that we assess future entrants to the uh, legal profession with the kind of skills that they would most likely display. I mean, I think that's what this California attorney practice analysis is trying to do. And I commend them for that. It's not clear to me that the kind of time conditions on a multiple choice exam uh, for content that may not be actually used by early entrants at all um, is, a, is a good indicator and actually matches the kind of job criteria that Cheryl was, was speaking to. So both on the validity mm -hmm. front and the fact that we, um, um, and the fact that the ostensible bases for justification for this seems to actually not be key to the indicator of what you're trying to do, I think there's, there's a problem there. Um, so this is a nice point by the, uh, the questioner about could we do these things differently? And I think that we could. We should be thinking about uh, soft skills, right? And other professional mm -hmm. skills that are incredibly important, team-based skills, how well people actually work well with others, right? This is a major aspect that's not studied in this kind of atomistic, individualized way. That's a longer story though. I, I do wanna build on that, Victor, and I totally, um relate to this uh, in part, you know, I did a fair amount of taking a part of the Ricci decision that came down in the Supreme Court several years ago involving New Haven firefighters who were applying for promotion within the fire department. And there was a utilization of a multi, uh, um, multiple choice test that tested on very particular kinds of terminology and usage in the fireman's manual uh, and it produced a very significant disparate, racially disparate impact. The city of New Haven decided to scrap the test because of that impact and start all over. Uh, the people that have been, or who believe they had been successful on the first test, that's actually another kind of finer point of the story, challenged uh, the test or challenged the city's decision to cancel the test as discrimination. Uh, and the court five to four found in their favor one of the things that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, among others, pointed out was to drill down on the question of what was the test actually testing for? You're asking for people who are going to serve leadership positions in the fire department, what skills do you actually want to know? And she likened the fact that testing the, for these skills on the basis of a multiple choice test alone was like trying to figure out who was a basketball player by only asking who can shoot good, three, good free throws. Well, you can be a very good free throw shooter, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be a very good basketball player. Um, and the point I think here is that it turned out there were alternatives that other jurisdictions were learning or using. They were called assessment centers and they would bring in the candidates and give them a bunch of different conflicting issues, crises, uh, and actually say, okay, now tell us how you would organize this. How would you begin? Where would you begin? How would you decide which takes priority? Where do, the, where do you want your staffing to go? What directions are you going to give? 
I'm not saying that's a perfect example, but it, again, one can see that it's an effort to try to get closer to the actual skills that you want. You want people who can exercise good judgment, leadership under pressure, and persuade other people to follow them. Um, so the, the point is that um, this question of are there alternatives, there are. The resistance to them, however, has to do with what you've mentioned, which is the kind of path dependency and the infrastructure that gets built up around it, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we're thinking about, you know, the amount of money, the, the, the entire infrastructure is built around this one exam. If we go to something else, that means an expensive, time-consuming kind of investigation. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we're actually trying to get at a particular goal, which is minimum competence, if we're actually trying to get at a goal of uh, reducing um, the kinds of harms that can occur in the public when people are, are not e equipped to do their jobs, we've got to figure out a better way uh, other, other than making the burden um, of a, um, I guess I would say, a, a criteria that is not related to the outcome, the burden of that criteria falling on um, traditionally excluded groups particularly when, as Devin pointed out, the entire structure has uh, historically was built to exclude those very groups. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it's not a question of can we, I think it's a question of political will. I think it's a question of how much we are willing to disrupt the sort of existing institutional structures. But again, my point is that it isn't just only for the benefit of people who have been historically excluded. There are people being excluded from this exam right now who are not people of color, who are competent to practice law for no particularly uh, clear, valid reason. Terrific. Or at least the reason wanna... that we've been given. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Victor and Cheryl for those responses to the questions. I wanna just add in two more thoughts about um, about the, the questions and comments, that, and then we'll kind of shift gears a little bit. So Peter Rich on the, from the UCLA um, faculty says, in addition to Professor Quintanilla's very convincing statistics, the bar's qualitative grading process privileges superficial recognition of a wide variety of issues. So this is getting at the qualitative assessment, um, not just the, um, you know, looking at the ultimate pass fail. As an official law school observer at Cal Bar grading sessions, I've seen the graders fail answers missing one minor point and ignore more focused examination of major issues. This understanding of legal knowledge is a gateway that disfavors takers with specific interests and passions and does not coincide with practice needs for specialization and community service. And more study is needed, but my experience has been that students of color are differentially affected. So I wanted to just put that out there as our, as our wrap up on, on the, the testing. And I wanna to turn to a different question um, and put this to you all. And it really has to do with um, how this regime that we're seeing in the, the bar exam, in bar exam passage, how it has a cognate, um, uh, in that earlier part of the pipeline that you showed us in that in that picture, Victor, which is how does it have to do with that that um, tightening of the pipeline or constriction of the pipeline or blockage of the pipeline, whatever we want to call it, at the entry point into law school, right? And um, you know, thinking about the construction of of kind of merit in quotes as happening vis-a-vis -vis LSAT and GPA and those kinds of things as well. So here is Jessica's question. With respect to its adverse impact on racial diversity in the legal profession, are there parallels between the nation's highest bar exam cut scores and the significant weight elite law schools place on maintaining high LSAT medians for matriculating students? Can one of our panel go first to answer that or address it? Give us your thoughts. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have um, access to the data to speak specifically to the full um, dimension of that question. What I found interesting is that 
it's um, with respect to the LSATs, at least, there is a way in which medians are quite fetishized in how mm -hmm. law schools think about their positions. It's interesting that with respect to bar passage, they're not. So, so if we, even if we adopted the same um, median baselining in the bar context that we do in the LSAT context, the story, the racial diversity story would be much better uh, than it currently is if I uh, understand um, Victor's study uh, correctly. So at one point in the pipeline, the focus on the medians actually tightens the pipeline and makes it really hard for people to get in. At the other end, the absence of a focus on the median actually closes it up. So the median is functioning in different ways depending on which part of the pipeline uh, one is on. Yeah, I think there is um, an analog. I mean, one of the ways in which when I teach Washington versus Davis, I, um, I often don't have to draw attention to this. The students figure this out rather quickly is that the way that the um, city of DC justified its use of the test of this civil service test that had nothing to do with policing skills was that it, it, it was validated against the trainees test that they took in the police academy. So in other words, there was a correlation between the result on the test in the academy and the ultimate civil service test. And one can sort of say, oh, okay, so if we have a correlation between two tests, have we shown anything about job performance, right? Or have we shown anything about competency? No, what we've shown is that there's correlations between the test. Um, and so similarly, one might wonder here if um, the way in which LSAT is sometimes um, as Devin says, quite rightly fetishized, it's often fetishized as predictive of the bar exam. So you mm -hmm. have here one test that is used to validate uh, or essentially justify the use of the second one. But now we have this question of what is the justification for the second one uh, that your research has usefully uh, um, highlighted. And we have to then go back to the question of where in any of this is competency for the practice of law. And as you've pointed out, what we know now, um, if we didn't know before, is that practice, first of all, the practice of law is so widely diverse. The kinds of things that people do with a law degree are very, very, very wide, but among them are certain kinds of skills. Certainly writing and analysis is one, but the ability to listen is actually kind of important. <laughs> uh, the ability to hear what a judge is saying to you and understand it and respond. Um, the ability to understand what your client is saying to you. Um, all of these things are crucial and certainly the ability to work in a team is essential if you're gonna get any work done as a lawyer. Obviously these are more difficult skills to test. I fear that sometimes what we do is we test what's easiest for us to test and call that competence. Victor. Um, so um, I just wanted to say that I, I thought uh, both sets of remarks were exact, were spot on. Um, and I will just contribute a little bit onto this um, at the end, um, which is that um, uh, from some of the data that, that, that we've seen, um, uh, I think there is a analog um, these are both choices, right? About choices about the median that's set by law schools, which then affects kind of later stages of uh, the pipeline and ultimately the diversity of the profession and choices about cut scores. We also see um, that uh, um, we see disparities on LSAT um, that are uh, quite pronounced and um, uh, akin to the kinds of disparities that we see on the bar exam, which is suggestive of the fact that if we um, like you if we unilaterally together as law schools decrease these median targets that that would actually increase and close racial gaps right in terms of uh, the admit the admittance into law school just like the kind of move that we made at the cut score right so these are both sets of moves that have a similar effect um, and I also think that um, uh, many of the questions that uh, Devin raised about 
why there are disparities um, on the LSAT are akin to questions about why there are disparities on bar passage, that we can talk about uh, structural reasons and we can talk about structural inequality in society. We can talk about lack of resources within schools. We can talk about um, systematic kind of racism across our society. Many of um, their uh, there are many reasons that have to go into those disparities that are not about um, merely the IQ quotient of examinees, for example. Um, and we also have the point about um, the LSAT and its predictiveness of, um, you know, whether it's predictive of bar performance, but now we're seeing that actually bar performance is not inherent either. Right, so that's a choice. So that's kind of interesting when we think about mm -hmm. whether the LSAT's predictive of bar exam, if bar exam scores can change. Um, it's, those aren't naturally set at where they are. Um, and then I think one argument is that the LSAT is predictive of performance in bar school, but I, I think we should, that's, we should complicate that. We should think about that and wonder how much that has to do with maybe grading systems within law schools around curves, right? And maybe that's actually suggestive of that, the fact that we're doing something wrong in law schools <laughs> Um, um, so, uh, I think this becomes really interesting and fruitful discussions. Um, and perhaps as Cheryl has pointed out, um, rather than thinking about measuring something that's quite easy, um, in terms of a high stakes exam and a particular score, which obscures all of these, maybe we should really be thinking about finding ways to truly assess our entrance for the kinds of qualities, abilities, skills that we would uh, seek to promote within the legal profession. Which is interesting because, you know, that's that has been on the table for a long time. I remember there was certainly a flurry of, of uh, research on that at the time of Prop 209. There was a Berkeley project, right? Um, having this more holistic kind of, um, kind of uh, process. Uh, we also have a couple of processes here at UCLA um, in terms of programmatic admissions. The largest is the public interest law program where they are looking at, uh, you know, they do interviews of all the applicants. They look at work before coming to law school. Um, and, you know, they, there's, there's some, I think uh, we could, we could, we've seen some very good results from that. Um, so there are a number of um, questions that are, um, well, there's one, one thing I wanna get you to talk about, Victor, um, that kind of goes back to some of the data, but it's related to a few of sort of some series of, of sort of some different pieces of different questions. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the fact that you all chose to do this study of the individual examinees, the, the exam takers, right? Um, as opposed to the times that people took the exam. So if somebody took the exam four times, they would have been four times in your in your study, right? Instead, you chose to know you're gonna you you're gonna look at these eighty three thousand, I think, or so. Um, people who took the exam in that 11 year period, regardless of how many times they took the exam. And um, this is an occasion to go back to a question that somebody had, which is the 76% 70, I think of those people um, who fail the exam one time um, at that 4, 4, 1440 um, cut score eventually pass. And then it's, so it's just 25% who don't pass. Did I get that right, Victor? So what we have is 75% uh, of people eventually pass at the 1440. Uh, yes, pass rate. got it, got it. Whereas 20, it's 25% of those who, who fail once don't ever pass and we don't, okay. Got it. Because somebody was asking about the never pass. And so it's that 25% group is that never, the 25% of the number who don't pass once never pass. Okay. Um, so what were the implications statistically and, and otherwise of choosing your end to be 
those exam takers. I think it was pretty, pretty significant. And I just don't want to lose sight of why you guys made that choice. Um, so this is um, uh, in the context of um, wondering how many additional applicants would have passed during this time horizon and what this would have meant to racial and ethnic uh, disparities across the time horizon, how would it would have affected the legal profession, you truly want to zero in on people, right? As opposed to exams, um, you want to, to zero in on people. Um, and the difficulty I think is that um, the reason why this is so rarely done is um, this, this data set is, is, is pretty unique actually in the sense that you're able to see um, an individual's complete um, exam history. And you can see whether they took the exam twice, three times, four times, um, and eventually did pass at these different rates. Um, so this would be the preferred way to be able to analyze this. And I should say, one of the other things that's remarkable about this data set is, um, this is the, the population of data. This is, this is it, this is the population of examinees. Yes. And so you can truly go back and you can say what the precise number would have been had we done this 10 years ago, which is remarkable. So we can actually say mm -hmm. definitively um, the number of uh, uh, both what the racial and ethnic disparities are and what this would have done to the composition of newly admitted attorneys and how that would have affected the legal profession. Um, it's remarkable. This would be the best way to do this. Um, otherwise, you'd be using exams and you wouldn't be able to know whether someone who failed exam one, say in 2010, is a similar taker in, in 2011. So this really gets it, you to the, to the core things. Thank you for that. And to put a finer point on it, we know people who harp on the bar passage as um, an indicator of people who shouldn't be admitted to law school are precisely doing that, making that mistake and talking about uh, outcomes in one, in one test as opposed to um, the eventually pass. And I just want to point out that we have somebody on who says, I'm a repeater, a Latina who has scored above 1390 over the last 11 years. But, but, you know, that's, that is, it's wonderful. We, we salute you, right? But it's so unfair, right? It's so unfair. Um, I want to shift to a different um, sort of set of questions that we have here. Um, in the chat for our last uh, 10 minutes. Um, and they have to do more with kind of, um, well, we could put them in the kind of category of political dynamics that keep things, keep the status quo moving in the way that it is. So let me just kind of read a couple of, of of these. Um, one says uh, from Christopher, Christopher, the California Supreme Court is one of the most diverse in the country. And the Supreme Court is the ultimate decision maker about the cut score, not the state bar, correct? Might you opine on what entrenched rach, racial challenges exist that might be holding the court back from going further than 1390? So that is one question, and I'm going to just gather a few of these that you guys can choose um, to respond to or or not. Um, from from Sarah, how can we encourage um, how can we encourage other jurisdictions to collect and reach release similar data? How do you respond to jurisdictions that fear collecting such data for a host of political reasons? Right. Um, now, here's another question on retroactivity. Right. So they made the 1390 decision, but they chose. They they said that they were not going to make it retroactive. Is that about you know gatekeeping? Is that about a political choice? Who would be uh, who would be against that? And then finally, I want to add to the mix something that I know is on the mind of a lot of our those in our audience, and I am having trouble finding the exact question, but basically it has to do with 
um, the current moment of COVID, right? And the fact that there is a movement um, being led by um, uh, recent graduates, right? The graduates in the class of 2020, and also some law school deans, including, um, including uh, the UC deans, um, to get provisional licensing um, without um, bar passage. And so I guess I put those all kind of in a bundle of questions that are about the, the politics of the current moment. Um, and, and in particular, I guess the racial politics, right, of, of these kinds of decisions. And I, and I wonder whether or not, just as you suggested, Victor, in your last comment that, you know, law schools need to think, we need to think, rethink legal education and how we're grading and how we're assessing students or not assessing students. Maybe this is this moment of crisis where we can actually achieve some, some deeper change. So I wonder if any of you would like to respond to, to any of that or throw out something else. Um, I'll just jump in on the last question about the provisional licensing and say that I think uh, that what would really be uh, a nice companion piece to this incredible work that Victor and his team have done is to really drill down some more on the jurisdictions that use diploma privilege. Um, it's not like we don't have available information about jurisdictions that do that. I know, uh, Victor, you allude to some of the um, issues that people have raised about them in some of the footnotes, but um, it's very interesting to think about what is the sort of reputation of the bar, what are people's experience of lawyers in jurisdictions where they don't have this barrier. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that it removes everything because of the reasons that Devin and others have talked about the front end kind of um, pipelines, exclusions that happen, but uh, I still think it's worthwhile considering because it might in fact open itself up to a way of reframing what we do that does not involve the kind of, as I was opining before, you know, significant kind of retooling and the development of another kind of test and the valid validation of that kind of test and so on. If we thought about maybe incorporating more kinds of the relevant material into law school itself <laughs> um, and thinking about some mechanisms that actually move more towards uh, diploma privilege as Laura's uh, reminded me, Wisconsin is one jurisdiction that has longstanding diploma privilege and I can't remember some of the others, but it strikes me that, that, that um, even though this is a temporary conversation, I think um, to your point, Laura, it's an opportunity to say, well, what are if we're, if we're concerned about the cost of those change, of that change, maybe we can start to look at other jurisdictions that have, do not rely on the bar exam to determine competency to practice law. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are really important uh, questions about uh, what moves the California Supreme Court. I can't say that I have um, great uh, insight on that point. The UC deans have been great. Uh, our own dean has uh, spearheaded efforts in this in this uh, arena as uh, well and is uh, on record as, as, as um, trying to push uh, the boundaries of this conversation. I do think, once again, where Cheryl landed is a good place to begin um, the conversation another way. I mean, presenting different kinds of options um, uh, increases the likelihood of uh, a more capacious move. Uh, that is to say, do you want diploma privilege or something else? I mean, I think it's really important uh, for them to understand that people are pushing for different kinds of um, interventions uh, at different levels of structural change. And, um, highlighting that this is a moment, uh, quite frankly, in which we're thinking about racial reckoning. I mean, are you going to be the institution that is completely outside of this moment of res racial reckoning? Really, you're gonna be that institution that doesn't even wanna go median on this. That just seems like <laughs> a radical position in the opposite direction where the median is a radical move. So, so I think, try I, mean, I do think the political economy of the 
whole arrangement and the context needs to be foregrounded somehow so that um, there's a recognition that, you know, uh, you can't just carry on as usual um, against the backdrop of uh, an instance in which people are saying, we have to take um, uh, black lives seriously. We have to take racial justice seriously. That means we have to take seriously who is barred and uh, can facilitate the very access to justice point with which Laura began. Um, so I, I couldn't agree more um, with uh, Devin and Cheryl's points. Um, I think we are in a moment of racial reckoning and that is the uh, political capital of the moment. I think that it is incredibly outdated to believe that um, uh, white lawyers and white lawyers alone um, are sufficient to represent people of color and um, California's rich diversity. Um, and there is a pressing need both on access to justice fronts, on racial justice and the need for uh, lawyers of color, especially now uh, to be uh, present within uh, the legal community. Um, and I think that does put pressure um, on what, uh, what, can, what can we do? Um, like Cheryl, I um, really think the idea of provisional licensing is quite valuable. Because um, I think that actually goes directly to the kinds of qualities and skills that you would hope to be able to assess, right? You're like keyed exactly on that. Right? Very, I think that's very important. Um, I think um, um, there are some interesting, there's some interesting data that we have, Wisconsin being one of the uh, states that has um, a uh, diploma privilege. And yet when you take a look at the disciplinary data, it's one of the states with some of the lowest discipline rates actually on the board, both in terms of complaints, investigations and discipline. Ah, that's interesting. Um, but I think one thing that I would be, uh, that I'd, I'd like to um, surface and discuss is the possibility that um, there's, there's clearly a need for a, another form of cut score. I think Devin is right that at least the median um, is the, the one that would be the most, it, it, it has to be uh, the one that's palpable. Um, and uh, my hope is that um, we could perhaps introduce a provisional licensure system when applicants like um, the one who spoke, right? Had a 1390 came very close, right? This person deserves a chance in a provisional licensure to kind of show that they're able to meet the, um, uh, uh, the qualities that we're seeking to promote. Um, and um, I think we should also be talking about potentially retroactivity, right? And retroactivity of this new 1390 cut score and how far back we should be allowing others to come forward, which um, my hope there too would be, that would be um, uh, a way of benefiting uh, many. Um, I just want to, to again say thank you for the wonderful and insightful comments that were raised. Um, uh, Devin, I will never think about cows in the same way. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and um, I wanted to say thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, all of you. And thank you to our wonderful audience. Um, as we close, uh, we might ask, where do we go from here? Um, please stay informed on these developments, whether you are planning to take the bar exam within the next few years or are a lawyer or citizen who cares deeply about equal access to the practice of law and access to justice for California's diverse population. Um, please um, organize and follow our, the efforts going on now to permanently move the cut score lower and uh, to seek retroactivity as you have heard about. Um, and please vote yes on Prop 16. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.